Wow! <laughs> what a countdown! <laughs> it was the longest 30 seconds of our lives. <laughs> of course you have to start with singing. Uh, well, I think that was one of the questions is they wanted uh, me to what, sing. What was one of the questions? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hello, welcome to Draftsman uh, Season 3, Episode whatever. And, uh, uh, nine! Nine! Nine. nine. It's episode nine. nine. And we're doing it live today. We got a bunch of questions coming in. If you guys want to ask questions, the link is right there. Broker.com slash 512. Um, and yeah, you just post a, post a question right there. We're Basically, if you guys don't know, if you're coming in from... If you're an audio listener to the podcast uh, and you haven't heard about the launch of Proco 2.0, this is kind of why we're doing this. Um, we just launched... The new platform that I've been talking about for years, and we've been doing something kind of every day with with guests and stuff. And last week we had, I like I think a live stream almost every day. Uh, lots of courses being launched. So yeah, go to Perka.com, check out all the new stuff, and uh, participate in the community. Marshall, what's up? How you been? Well, I'm ready. I'm fresh. And, well, I don't know whether I'm ready, but I'm fresh. I feel like all right. We've got uh, a live audience, and this is unusual yeah. for us. We've only had it about. Once. Three times in our lives. Three. Wait. Well, Draftsman, I think, has li been live only one time. Yes, it has. Yeah. So. And we did a Comic Con one too. That was live, live, like in that person, was like in front of people. Yeah, <laughs> in front of people. <laughs> the drops of sweat and everything. Just er yeah. yeah, it was real. Yeah. But this is this is sort of like that too, but with a bigger audience. How many people do we have? I don't know. Okay, John maybe is controlling the stream. Yeah, I shouldn't ask I questions like that. We're supposed to stick to the task at hand. Yeah, let's stick to the task. Should I just yeah. jump into questions? Okay, or you got something to say? You you always like to promote stuff. I, well, I, <laughs> so well, I, I got something nightly. to promote. Yeah. <laughs> well, promote. how about this? While I while I uh, get that first question, you promote your. You probably have another workshop coming up, huh? Yeah, I have another workshop coming up. <laughs> of starting, course you do. Starting this Saturday. Uh, <laughs> but you can go to my website, martialart.com, to hear about it. You'll probably hear about it in response to these questions. But no, if I have something to promote, what I want to promote is goodwill, knowledge, <laughs> wisdom. Peace, health, and happiness to everybody. Yeah. Aren't those things worth promoting? Oh, yeah. They need to be promoted. <laughs> okay. Well, you just spent all your time promoting peace. Health and happiness instead of your yeah. workshop. So Goodwill, on to the questions. <laughs> wisdom. All right. First question, Marshall. Uh, this comes from John. What the hell, John? You're sticking your own question into the front. This is our John. John <laughs> this is our John, the guy in control yeah. here. Okay. Does Marshall have any sculpting experience? If so, what has he sculpted? Oh, I don't think... <laughs> He was okay. So John is the marketing guy. I think he wasn't trying to. He was trying to use this as an opportunity to promote the sculpting course that just came out. <laughs> he probably okay. didn't want me to say that. Oh, it's John. He's trying to fake questions here. John, yeah, we don't. Every, that's not how we do things here. Everything. Everything is real. has an agenda. Yeah. Every question <laughs> is is. Uh, I I started to realize this reading Costco's magazine that every time they'd have an article that would be informative and it would be useful. It was not there just to be informative and useful. It was there because they had a new shipment of products that they were trying to sell. So, Yeah, he, was, he has a, a note at the, under the question and says, maybe talk about the new YouTube channel too and the short code for it. <laughs> it's like he gave me some marketing notes. Okay, okay. Uh, the new YouTube channel. Yeah, we started Proco 3D YouTube channel. We just launched it. Go follow it if you're into sculpting and 3D modeling. Short code, I don't remember. I think it's proco.com slash YouTube 3D. I don't know. <laughs> but if you type proco 3D into YouTube, you'll find it. Okay. Do I get to answer the question, you, though? You, your question. Me. Well, it, the real agenda here was to promote. Yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah, fake yeah. question. Yeah, 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 but yeah. I actually do want to hear it. What uh, Sculpting, uh, Marshall. My experience sculpting was <laughs> as a high school student when we had to sculpt characters of... Uh, the one with Katrina Van Tassel and Brom Bones and, and Ichabod Crane, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And so I did little busts of them, and I put a lot of time into them and didn't know what I was doing, and I kind of liked it. And then in college, I took a couple 3D design classes, and I did some sculpting, and I poured into it, but I found out something. I didn't feel like a sculptor. Some people just love to sculpt. But one thing about sculpting, though, 
When in 1987, I went to Paris by myself for one week and I had Rodin's book on art and artists, which was my main reading for that week while I went to see his backyard and go see sculptures around uh, Paris. And it was, it was pivotal in my life. I wasn't yet 30 years old, but I decided that I loved drawing more than painting and maybe I loved sculpture as an art form even more than those other two. But that does not mean that I do it. I have been around sculptors who just love to sculpt. They've got an impulse to sculpt. So I leave that to them. And I'm a fan of yeah. sculpture, not a sculptor. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for answering the fake question. But hey, well, how about you? You sculpt or do you sculpt? <laughs> I, I, a little. I, I would not call myself a sculptor. I've taken like two semesters of sculpting classes and it was primarily aimed at learning anatomy. It was an ecorche uh, anatomy yeah. sculpting class where we, we start with a skeleton, we get all the bones, then we add each muscle on top of the bones. And so it wasn't a sculpting course, it was an anatomy course, but the medium just happened to be clay. So, yeah. yeah. But it was fun. Oh, I also did a quick sketch portrait sculpting class, and that was all about sculpture. And that, that I actually really enjoyed that. <laughs> was it the that quickness was... of it that you enjoyed? Yeah. I, mm, well, quick sketch me, in sculpture, it's it's more like you know several hours. Or we I think we spent like nine hours on it. But that's pretty fast, I guess, for beginner sculptors. <laughs> you know, it's kind yeah. of a quick sketch. But I, I yeah, I, I enjoyed it just because it, it was. I was already kind of good at drawing by then when I took that, and it was I enjoyed using my drawing skills to try to sculpt. It was. It was interesting. It was like it really did help. Learning to draw really did help me to be able to get like good proportions on the sculpt and like look at each angle and try to make sure that the shapes look good. So mm -hmm. I, I totally approached it as a draftsman. And but I mean, I, you know, obviously I, I'm not good at it. Anyway, let, let, let's move on to another question. Okay. I think. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Roberto C. What would Marshall from today say to Marshall when he was starting out in art? What are the challenges and advantages of being a mature person still working as an artist? All I hear from the younger crowd are comments that are a lot like an athlete's mindset. And as I get older, I'm not sure I want to be like that all the time, mm. but I still want to be able to work. Love you guys. He Appreciate the love. Yeah. Uh, this we I, love you this, too. I, I counted the three parts in there. There was what would I say to the younger me? Yeah. I think the real question is, um, he, he's old. really concerned about the the athletic, like the the real seriousness seriousness of the studying, being an athlete. You know, approaching yeah. it like an athlete who's, yeah. Anyway, go yeah. Ahead. Well, <laughs> let, let me tell you. But since since I heard it in three parts, let me let me respond in three parts. One is what I'd say to my younger self. I, it's if I could talk to the eighteen year old me about my art career, it's it's hard to say because there's there's so many things. But if it was it had to boil it down to one thing, it might just be accept fewer clients. When I was so uh, beginning, I would say accept any client. And as time went on, I got so used to, well, they'll pay me money, I'll do it. Uh, I wish I would have ended relationships faster. I wish I would have, have uh, said this isn't a good fit and moved on. That would be the main thing, I think. Uh, but then the rest of it, the other answers are what I teach. If you're in my classes, you know that you've got a guy in his 60s teaching to himself in his late teens and early 20s. So it's hard to unpack that answer in, in a matter of a, a quick question. Uh, the second part of it was was about the advantages and what was the other thing? The challenges? Uh, uh, let me see. What are the challenges and advantage of, advantages of being a mature person still working as an artist? Oh, well, uh, the, the challenges are what they always were their deadlines that when you have mm. to have it done by a certain time when you've got when you've got the class starting but by the way you also asked yeah. as an artist i'm not an artist i'm not, i mean i'm not making my living as an artist i'm making my living as a teacher so they are different things but they do have that in common is that each of them has a point where you say it has to be done because the audience is waiting and that is a good thing but it is also a challenge by its nature that it must be uh, ready. The dinner must be cooked when the people are hungry. So that has not really changed much. And I'm not that much older to where I don't have the strength to go for long days. So that isn't a big deal. But the thing about the advantages, the advantages are wonderful 
the advantages are that you know more and you know what not to do. And hopefully you've learned, you've learned something about craft, but you've also learned things about expending energy. John Richardson, the acting teacher, used to talk about the difference between a young body and an old body when you put it in front of a camera and that you look at children and they just wiggle around all the time. They've got all sorts of excess energy. Whereas you look at older people. And when I looked at him, he was about 70 when I first started studying with him. He never wasted a bit of movement. He never put any energy into something that wasn't useful for what he was doing. And I think that that applies in a broader spectrum too, that you start to learn to say no to things and not uh, waste energy. That is the advantage of, of working as you get older. Now, the last thing, the last thing was about athletes mentality. Yep. I'm sorry to ask you to repeat it, but could you so that I can be sure that I answer the question and not whatever I want to talk about? Yeah. All I hear from the younger crowd are comments that a lot that are a lot like an athlete's mindset. And as I get older, I'm not sure I want to be like that all the time, but I still want to be able to work. Okay. Love you guys. Yes, I love the love you guys. Yeah. Hey, well, I've got a good one. And this is, who is asking this? Roberto. Roberto. Roberto, the athlete metaphor is a good one, especially for people who are competitive and full of energy. So we don't want to discount that. Training like an athlete has a lot to do with this, but it is not the only one. And as you get older, it may not be the best one. Um, my, the one I've adopted consciously as a coach. But if you're studying, if you're interested in plants, the garden one goes a long way because... <laughs> that seems like it, it'd be the one for the older crowd. It is the, the one for the older crowd. Because one of the things you see about, I've been watching plants this, this spring for the first time in my life, really watching them. I've done it a couple times before, but now I'm making it a, a point to. You cannot make a plant grow faster or a flower bloom faster by sweating over it and getting uh, agitated. And so there comes a point when you have to stretch something out over weeks or months to see any results that you just say, okay. I'll watch and see when it happens. And there, there's a, necess, uh, a necessary shift of energy. But if you can find something other than athletes uh, to, to use as, if I work on this for six months, if I do the work and put the water in and keep, keep an eye on it, it will do the thing that it will do. That's, that's, what, that's the first one that occurs to me just because I'm reading books about plants and botany and it's it's affecting my mindset. If you can find a better one, great. Maybe do, is there chat running through here where people can throw out other possibilities for old people? Um, yeah. <laughs> There's Okay, we went from athlete to coach to uh gardener to uh investor. Mm, yeah, to I don't know, to bodybuilder. And yeah, bodybuilder. That's an, body an, that's an yeah, athlete. That's an mind. athlete. <laughs> ah, don't ask me. To a circus performer? I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I, I, now people are able to, when we speak, Yeah. people are able to respond and we should be able to see them in the chat on something, right? No, uh, John is sending us questions. Oh, he's John he, he's going through, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they come in too fast for us to talk and be got, able to actually okay. read. We're, we're so he's, he's, to, he's, yeah. he's sending us the stuff we need to see. Appeal to John. <laughs> yeah. Ask okay. questions. Maybe, maybe we should go on. And if John yes. collects the very best of the suggested analogies, we can read them at the end as dessert. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Next question is from Tarek. Hello, Stan and Marshall. I have two questions. One, when, when was the point where you learned to focus? In which I mean focus strictly on art, improving and expanding your skills. The reason being I'm finishing college this summer and I just now got to the point where I draw practice every day because my professor said I lacked focus. But now I think I ran into a problem because now I want to be a jack of all trades. One day I'm figure drawing, then the next painting, then digital. Should I focus on one thing and gain a good understanding, then move on, or should I allow creativity to take over or whatever? Um, well, Complex I'm, question. Yeah, and I only heard one question in there, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> but let's start with you. When did you learn to focus? Never. <laughs> I mean, okay, so I hyper-focus for, for like chunks of time, right? Like I'll, 
I have a lot of things that I'm interested that I want to be do, able to be doing and, and like too many things. But when I, I'm doing one thing, I'm hyper focused on that one thing. And that could be just for three hours. That could be for the day or that could be for three weeks. I could be really, really focused on this one specific thing that I need to make sure it gets done. Um, when I was a student, I had, I always had like two or three things that I was like really focused on and I would s switch between them because you, you can't do one thing the whole day, right? You, you need to be able to like, if, you, if you're just done drawing for the day, you need to be able to switch to something that is still kind of productive. I mean, you don't need to, but you know, as a young person, I, I did feel like I needed to be always be doing, being productive. I didn't have a family yet. It's the best time to be productive uh, is when you're young. And so when I was tired of drawing for the day, I would switch over and I would do, you know, focus on 3D animation or, or trying to figure out the, whatever business I was working on. And it's a different mind, you know, I switch over and I, I let my brain rest um, from one thing to the next, um, it'd be really good to maybe have a physical activity that you're also focused on <laughs> so that when you switch from drawing, you can switch to something that isn't also re requiring you to be sitting. Um, that's one thing I would have told my younger self is to be addicted to some kind of physical activity, not just things in front of a computer. Good thinking. Yeah. Now, the, that, the issue of focus when you asked when did I learn to focus, I didn't learn to focus because I was famous as a child for sitting in front of the record player and same, playing the same record over and over and over and over and over before I could, before I could uh, do anything else. And I still do that. But I think you were talking about career focus. Is is, is can he? You read it was, um, hold on. Let me let me brief let me briefly skim it. He's someone in which I'm, he says, I mean, focus strictly on art improving and expanding your skills. So he's not talking about career focus. He's talking about just learning skills. Okay. Um, and when it's, as far as learning skills, I, I think it, it is good to have a few at a time, personally. That, that's an opinion. I, I'm sure people have, some, we could say, focus on one thing and that they could also be correct. Maybe it, it really depends on you as the person, like what's better for you. Yeah. Um, so. But any single focus, you say, I am going to be an oil painter, then that means you've got a number of sub-disciplines that will have their variations. And you say one yeah. of them is actually applying the paint to the, uh, to the canvas. The other is studying theory. The other is going to museums. The other is getting the model shot. So varying it up, yeah, is a big deal. But yeah, I want to mention something that I, I don't think I've mentioned on this podcast before, but it relates to this wow. business of focusing did he say that he's finishing up school and he said that he's heard that teachers have said that you've got a lack uh, of focus? I'm finishing college this summer. Yeah. And, and, and t teachers told him he needs to focus. If more than one teacher, if three yeah. or more teachers have told you you need focus, then you probably need to focus. Yeah. They're, they're all recognizing something. Yeah. Maybe you're just distracted. Maybe you have so many things that you're enjoying that you're not when you're working on one thing, you're distracted by all the other things and you're not giving yourself enough time to improve on one thing. Um, Cause it really depends on, on you and how much time you have in the day to focus on stuff. If you really are like spending 10 hours a day doing things that are improving your skills, you have enough time in a day to focus on many things and be okay. But if you, if you're the person type of person that likes to, you know, social life is really important to you and you spend three to five hours a day one thing a day D do not break up those three to five hours to several things spend your time on one thing um but yeah marshall what did i interrupt you <laughs> no you know you didn't interrupt, uh, okay. interrupt me but uh there was something that i was wanted to to say yes and to that uh it was okay teachers uh lack of focus uh get focused a lot of time in a day to vary it up mm -hmm. uh, Oh, oh, here's what occurred to me. There is nothing that makes you focus faster than how you're going to make your living if you're in need of money. <laughs> uh, because once you start getting hired for something, you learn quickly that if you're going to get rehired for it, to set aside other things, which means that you focus, focus, focus on this thing that makes you money. And then that tends to be uh, the, the rut you get into. But using the focus term, uh, 
there's nothing wrong with not being focused. You get a new camera and it's not, oh, this camera doesn't work. It's not focused. <laughs> well, well, that's not good. <laughs> well, focus it. Focus it. And, and you know, even the autofocus says a little too far that way, a little too far that way, it's got to be right there. So part of what you've done in school is you've experimented around with a lot of things and you've been exposed to a lot of different teachers and a lot of different students and seen which students succeed more than others and whether they're focused or whether they're not focused. You've had a lot of opportunity to learn about how to focus. Now is your opportunity to choose what to focus on. And if, like a good camera, you know how to focus and you can focus on landscapes and still lifes and portraits and all sorts of things, that could be really good. I'm a focused person on what I do at any given moment. So, so exploit the, the focus term to just look each day and each week and as you go through your year to say, what did I focus on and what ended up being a blur? And that may help you because you'll find that there are some things you really like to see in crisp detail and to develop. Uh, was there more to the question? Um, he wants to be a jack of all trades. Um. Basically. I got something yeah, to say I about that. We, yeah, go ahead. Uh, some people who are jacks of all trades are called creative directors, art directors, uh, people who have a number of people working for them and they know their different disciplines. And if if you are not the type who is easily who easily focuses, as some of us are, but I know a lot of people will say I've got I've been diagnosed with ADHD or whatever, you may have a more valuable role because your eyes are on the horizon to see everything and try to keep juggle a lot of different things. And if you can make that part of your strength, that I juggle a lot of balls at the same time and I help them and I bring nurture to them, encouragement and empowerment to the people that are working for me. One of the guys that I know whose mind just flips from one thing to another, to another, to another is also one of the great creative directors of my past. Everybody liked him. He worked with everybody, but he could never stay in one two square foot bit for more than 20 seconds before he needed to wander around to another like a bee going from flower to flower. Cool. Wait, who, who is that? That's Bruce. And Bruce. if Bruce knows that I, you, you, Bruce was, uh, was Bruce a guest on our, are, are you asking me who I'm referring to? Yeah, well, people, you just mentioned someone, you didn't tell them who you're talking about. Well, yeah, but, you know, Bruce won't mind that I mention oh, does it? When I mention creative directors and art directors and colleagues, sometimes they would prefer that I don't mention them by name. Oh, okay. Whenever okay, I mention somebody it. by name, it's it's usually because I know got they're it. okay with I thought you that. just forgot. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. This comes from Elvis. Can you guys speak a bit more about your note-taking process in regards to learning? Have you incorporated a Zettelkasten-like system at this point? Stan, what is that software that you mentioned using for your notes? Did we publish the episode yet where I talk about Zettelkasten? I know we I recorded it. This, we didn't publish. Okay. It so, might have been the writing the natural way one. Right in the natural way. Maybe, also, there was one about sketching. Maybe we did publish it. Anyway. Any, yeah, anyway. We, we, we did record we recently. <laughs> I yeah. don't remember if we published it. Uh, we did record one where I talk. I kind of summarized Zettelkasten, right? Mm -hmm. I did? Yeah, did. <laughs> Shoot. I don't know. Um, anyway, if if it's not in the sketching one, it's it's maybe in the writing the natural way, but um pretty sure it was in the sketching one. But but anyway, yeah, Zettelkasten, I love it. I'm not gonna try to explain it right now. Um there there's much better resources to explain Zettelkasten. Um but the software that I, that I mentioned was Rome Research. It's R O A M research. Um there, and there's several others that are free that you could use for yeah. taking notes in the Zettelkasten method. Um, yeah. Let's I'll add to... something to this that is not yeah. specific. Uh, it's just general about community. I had a wonderful group in visual storytelling this last semester. And mm -hmm. the first session that we met, we part of our topic for that evening John, Cameron, was John. the, uh, how do you take notes? If you are regularly producing ideas, as many creative people are, how do you document them? How do you keep, how do you carry around a bucket so that every little bit of dew that you take off of the flowers, you are accumulating that? And how will you organize it? And I showed how I do it with Omni Outliner and what, what I don't like about it. But several students had ways of doing it. And even if you don't have a way of doing it now, here's the big point. 
if you're in a community of people who care about that and who talk about it and debate that oh, I like this about it, oh, I don't like that about it, then at least you are working on a problem that is really important for your long-term creativity, which is that you have a way to collect your ideas and be able to find things in there. Uh, spending time on that early on in your creative life is better than later. Yeah. I agree. And especially with the Zettelcast, then that really applies too, because it kind of takes time to grow your Zettelcasting yeah. um, before it becomes really, really useful. But it is exponentially more useful as, as you use it. Um, yeah. So anyway, Zettel, I, I love it. I started using it last year and, and it's been absolutely wonderful. And I wish that I had uh, uh, yeah. adopted something like that 30, 30, 40 years ago. And it works really well for someone like me who is really forgetful. Like I just, mm -hmm. I forget so much. And I'm able to also incorporate um, uh, space repetition into my Zettelkasten, which is, it reminds me of notes that I marked as something I want to be reminded of in a spaced uh, period of time. So Does like really? if I, if I make a, an evergreen note then I'm like, okay, this is an evergreen note. I want to remember this forever. It'll, it'll come up in, in my daily, my daily notes the following day, then like five days later, then a few weeks later, then a few months later, then a year later. And so I have this like spaced repetition over time and it, it, it makes it so that I could actually remember this permanently. Um, and, Stan, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's like a yeah. perfect collaborative partner. Yeah, it's called a, it's like a second brain. That's what they call yeah. it. It really is. And it's the way it's organized, it's really easy to flow through your thoughts because all your notes are connected instead of what you know, notes from this book are here in this little area, and then notes from this book that is actually the same subject are over here, but they're not connected together. That are, you know, anyway, it's great. Um, it sounds great. It is great. It's wonderful. okay. <laughs> Personal um, organization and creative. Yeah. Um, Sketch Sparrow says, Hi, Proko. There's a lot of tutorials and teaching on the internet about drawing and painting, but there are basically no tutorials about pre-drawing and painting preparations. By that, I mean how to stretch paper on a board for drawing purposes, what board should, should we use, what paper to be stretched on the board, etc. I have learned a lot from you over the years. I would like to take a moment to thank you for all the wisdom you shared with us. You're a real life Yoda. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I'm a Yoda. You that's are. Wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, no, actually, that's, that's true. Um, I think the reason that there aren't is because there's so many different... It's not like you can make one course for every everything right like yeah. you could work one artist could be working with these materials by stretching their paper another artist just uses newsprint another artist uh, just does it in a sketchbook uh, another artist like actually you know uh, will use watercolor paper and tone it and it, it's just it like depends so much on the artist tools are not like they're not rules you really can experiment with the tools, but it's still very important information. And this is stuff that you you need to learn. Um, and I think that kind of information right now, at least on Proco, uh, the best place to get it is like in the masterpiece demos because each artist goes over their specific materials and how they are preparing it. Like if you watch Westerbergs, he'll show you how he prepares a, a panel. Um, and uh yeah I, I think aaron blaze and his lion demo like he'll show you what he paper he uses and it's different see it's like each masterpiece demo you watch is gonna be something completely different um and like for here like for example and john can you switch to oh yeah you are on full screen on me hold on a second um let me see if this works. I have a camera. There, I do have a camera up there. So wow. like this board or this drawing I did, I stretched it on on a like this frame, this wooden frame. Um and, you know, it's even stapled just like a canvas would be stapled. Um and the way I did this was I I drenched this paper, this watercolor paper in water. Um 
and then I, I, I kind of stretched it while it was wet. Um, and, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't think I showed that in my anatomy demo when I was doing it, or maybe I, no, I, I don't think I did, but you're right. Um, it def there definitely is a need for that. One, one tutorial I, I do recommend for it um, that I've personally watched was Amaya. Um, oh, shoot, what's her last name? Um, shoot, hold on, give me a second. Do you know who I'm talking about, Marshall? No, no I, yes, I do, because you, Amaya, had this, uh, uh, you had this on your, your channel, no, right? No, I didn't. Amaya, no, okay, I, didn't. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, actually. It's Amaya Ger Gerpide or Gerpide. No, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Amaya. Uh, but she has a, um, a, what is it called? It's like a mixed media workshop that she taught. And she goes a lot over her materials and stuff. And she uses her materials really ex experimentally and just um, in, a, in a really interesting way. It's not just like a pencil on paper. So go, go check her, her stuff out um, but if you're interested there, in that. There's, as you mentioned earlier, this is such a specific question mm -hmm. uh, about such a general area, that material artist's handbook of materials and techniques that is about that thick was that thick because it was trying to teach all that stuff. And you may not be using your search engine to maximum effect. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. Use, you mean stretch canvas, uh, stretch watercolor paper. Uh, yeah. Be specific uh, about what it is you're seek seeking. No, nobody can have a YouTube channel that's going to teach you every one of those things, or at least it's unlikely. That's such a uh, great point, Marshall. The, the way I figured out how to stretch that paper on the board I just showed you was I did a search on Google and it brought me to several YouTube videos. I watched like five of them. I compared all the different ways people did it. Because even then, each person I saw do it did it a little bit differently. And so I had to compare and, and do some research like who was right here. Um, and, and also then you just experiment as well because your paper that you got might be different from the paper that other person has. There's so. another thing is that you just, you learn by doing it and seeing what doesn't work, but that has to happen in the educational stages, not when you're under a uh, deadline. You know, yeah. this is the opposite problem of what we used to have. It used to be that if you got a book on oil painting or watercolor or whatever, they would talk about two things primarily. One was the different kinds of canvases, the different kinds of absorption, fat over lean, all of the other stuff, the, the review of the materials and, and the, the surfaces. And then they talk about composition in one way or another. Uh, but it's like, who was going to teach you how to draw? We couldn't find it. Now we've got the opposite problem. We've got uh, everybody teaching anatomy and perspective and form and light and shade, but they aren't teaching us specifically about the materials. And it may be increasingly less relevant for most artists because so everybody's using digital techniques now. Yeah, well... Most artists I talk to that use, at least that use both, <laughs> mm -hmm. recommend starting with traditional and moving on to digital. But, eh, you know. Oh, that question's bound to come up in here. <laughs> it comes up every time almost. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have we answered this question? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Google. <laughs> the answer is Google and YouTube. Um, it's out there. There's so much information out there. You just kind of have to do your own um, experimentation, your own, you know, a little self-study there. Hi, Brooke. Oh, no, that's the same question. <laughs> okay. Hi, Brooke. Oh, hold on. Um, the one aspect of traditional art school I'm having trouble recreating on my own is time with a live model. Oh, yeah. Especially long pose, multiple hour ones. The only thing local I can find outside of a school are strictly for gesture drawing. Any suggestions? I've been restoring the self portraits and still life. I'm this close to just starting something on my own. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Get a little job. closer. There you go. Uh, thank you. And I always look forward to the next episode. It's been a huge help in navigating my education. I cannot thank you both enough. Um, yeah, you think you answered your own question. If there's nothing around you, you start your own thing. <laughs> you really don't need that many uh, people to participate to make it uh, cost effective, I guess. You, know, you don't need to make money off of organizing these events. You just need to have enough people to, to be able to split the cost of the, the model fee. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's like, it, it really isn't that much. You get three people. And what is, I mean, I don't know how much life models get paid now. I think it's like 20 bucks an hour. Um, and so if you have a three hour life drawing session, you got three artists there with you. You split that $60 fee, 20 bucks each. That's expensive. You know, that's expensive, but, um, but you get six artists. You get, they get, yeah, but I'm just saying three artists is like, well, now it's starting to get like kind of reasonable, but yeah, six artists. And now it's 10 bucks each for three yeah. hours. That, that's that, that's totally worth it. Come on. That's like lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to add to this okay one. yeah that, that's it you, you start your own thing but yeah um oh I, I do have one more thing uh you you could also draw from casts i know a lot of schools do a lot of cast drawing before they get they even allow you to draw from a model that's right um right i, I know a lot of european uh ateliers and then like in Russia, I'm pretty sure they do a full year of just cast drawings. It makes sense. Um, where you don't have to worry about the model moving and it's, you know, you just study that cast. So you can buy some casts. Um, they're, they could be pretty cheap, I think. <laughs> I only have one. Uh, and it's, I got, I got it as a gift from a friend. He made casts and he was selling them and he just, he gave me one. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Well, I love that I'm this close to starting it on my own. Yeah, I'm this close. You just got to get yeah. a little closer. Yeah. Keep keep going. Uh, list, lots of questions regarding release of Marshall's Perspective course. <laughs> yeah. So should we I just think, address it? I think, yeah, I think they just grouped all of them together into this one oh, thing. okay. <laughs> so you want to address it? So yeah. Yes. I'm not working on the Perspective course right now because I'm yeah. here. <laughs> I'm here doing a live podcast for you, oh. but I am preparing my life to actually get to this perspective course. So to get to it, wait, you yeah, I'm getting to it. Very That's my along. next, it is my very next thing to focus on this. <laughs> you're, you're making people think that you didn't even start it. right? Now. <laughs> I, oh yes. I started it years ago. You, he's very able to far it. into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But to, to make it worthwhile means that I've got to set other things aside. This is one of the hardest things is to say no, no, no to this so that I can say yeah. yes to this. So I'm doing what I can do and I am going to do all that I can do. So hang in there. But I care about it more than you do. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. No, the people that originally heard about it and were excited about they're it. They're all old and dead now. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all masters of perspective by this point. They're, they didn't, they're not going to wait six years no, to, for you to come out years. with your perspective basics course. Yeah, they've already learned it. They don't need it anymore. Yeah, I know. So it's funny the the original it went from people being super excited to being annoyed to being pissed off to now thinking it's just hilarious that you haven't done yeah, it yet. I'm glad they find it funny because <laughs> they've they they're already teaching their own perspective courses. And... That's right. Now they have mastered it, and they say there yeah. used to be rumors back in the early 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Andy says, hi, Marshall. I've seen and appreciated your original animal anatomy course on Nomen. Do you have any plans to bring an updated version of this to Proco? Not until I'm done with perspective. Good answer. So, yeah, 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 that's <laughs> the, it's, it's priorities. But the, the you know, that, that Nomen DVD, which was called Introduction to Animal Anatomy, was the best I could do. And uh, it was, you know, it's short. It's, what is it, an hour plus or so? And it's not the same as my animal drawing workshop, my animal anatomy workshop that I've taught in colleges, which is a walk through many of the great books and other people's plates with the Nomen DVD. I could not use other people's plates. So I had to do all the artwork myself or have some students help me with it. So that's the weakest thing about that course is that the artwork isn't that great. But I'm happy with trains of thought. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do. I want to collaborate with other people on a really good anatomy course for comparing human and animal sometime soon, but not in the next year. So yes, the answer is yes. I love the subject and I'd like to package the material some, somehow better. Yeah. As far as I know, Marshall this year is, is going to be focused on the perspective course. That's right. So not the animal <laughs> anatomy course. I'm setting yes. it aside for the time being. Yeah. Yes. Cool. 
and you're not you're not teaching anything the rest of the year. Is that what I? Uh, well, I'm teaching this the, composition boot camp right. this summer. Yeah, that this is summer. a big deal. But that's deal. it. You're not teaching in college. Yes, I am. I'm teaching at Fullerton College in fall, two days a week. But <laughs> those Wait, are that the boot camp. No, af after the boot camp. Yeah. Oh, I thought you're not teaching anything. I've got a I've got a schedule that I can show. Okay. Okay. I can show Sounds my good. next two years, but I don't know whether I should do it now. No, it's okay. Maybe toward the end. Yeah. Okay. Maybe on your website. Uh, yeah, we can put it on my website if you want. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, Martin Punt. I enjoy drawing and painting as a hobby and try to spend as much time as I can on art. However, my workspace for drawing painting is in the living room. Mm. Being the father of two kids, this can mm. sometimes be problematic. Uh, noise canceling headphones for the win. Jeez. For people like me with limited space, what are some good tips to set up a home atelier workspace for painting and drawing? What would your dream atelier look like if the sky was the limit? Big fan of the podcast. Best wishes. I mean, I already got mine. I can't complain. <laughs> um, you could watch my Building a Dream Studio vlog and you'll see mine. It, I don't need to flaunt it now. I've already well, we, flaunted it. We, and we had a conversation about the challenge of artists having yeah. kids. We had a whole podcast devoted to that. Was it, was it about environment? Let me look it up. No, there was another one that had to do with environment. So, yeah, we have answered what, what, those questions as much as I feel like I have it in me to answer. And the main thing is just, it's it's a rough thing. What, what, yeah. what more can I can say that you've got a challenge that is a life challenge. And if you make it through, I'm interested to hear your pointers and tips to other people for what helped. You're pioneering. Yeah, we, we have a... Part of our do, uh, DIY art school is part five. It's called Workspace and Equipment. We did talk about workspace. Um, we also had one on toxic environments, but that's, the, you know, kids running around is not a toxic environment. No, it isn't. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a toxic. But it, it, it's obviously not good for either one. You know, it's like your, your kids want, you know, want to hang out with you and you're right there, but you're saying no to them all the time. That's probably not good. And then also, you you ha you're trying to focus on your art, and you can't. Like, you, it's probably hurting both. And yeah. so it's it's probably best to be able to separate them and fully focus on your kids when you when you're with the kids, and fully focus on your art when you're doing your art. Uh, but it, it may yeah. help to have historical precedents too, where you look at people who've done this and see the spectrum. Uh, Maxfield Parrish, I'm told, was just you know, is isolated himself. N.C. Wyeth had rules for his kids. Uh, Ray Bradbury talks about him in his Sin and the Art of Writing, about not being able to get work done and having to separate the studio. But there was one artist, and I don't know who it was. It might have been Howard Pyle, uh, or it may one have been an older Dutch master who just loved the kids being around. Apparently, there was enough, enough boundaries enough instead of putting the kid in in the cage in the crib put the the mom or the dad in the in the cage in the crib so the kids can make the chaos all the way around them but there's all sorts of ways you're going to solve it and one way is to say who has solved it who had children and succeeded look at their stories yeah. and see what the spectrum is but we have already addressed that we have yeah um Ross says, I'm a traditional artist who gets annoyed with the constant changes in software like Photoshop and <laughs> new versions of Blender. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any thoughts on designing obsolescence. Obsolescence. Ob obsolescence. Designed obsolescence. Obsolescence? Okay, he spelled it wrong. <laughs> in the world of digital art. I blame you, Ross. <laughs> and obsolete. But obso obsolescence is the right. Is the, obsolescence, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> God. You don't have trouble with this, do you? What? The, the, oh, the, the with the question? Uh, yeah, no, no, like, yeah, with what he's referring to. Nah, no. I mean, I mean, it is annoying. Everything always needs an update. It's like you get, a, you turn on your computer and everything needs an update and a restart. <laughs> it's kind of annoying yeah um so yeah i know i get annoyed too but 
I mean, I enjoy the updates though. Like when they have new tools, they're wonderful. If you, you know, they are making improvements. So I'd rather have that than just stick with like, you know, Photoshop from 20 years ago. <laughs> it's, mm. it's obviously a better version now. So is it? It is. <laughs> wait, wait, go back to, I, I want to see, I can't see Marshall's face, John. What, what was that sarcasm? Yeah, it was sarcastic. I don't. I don't know. I've, I've got my oh, old, old version. You have your oh, the, what is it? Photoshop yeah. two. Yeah, uh, Ross, uh, you're you. You may may not want me to answer this question because in the '90s I was not an early adopter, but I was pretty early, and you I were. even got invited to speak at the Professional Digital Imaging Group Services Group because I was somewhat of an innovator with digital tools because I was so excited about what you could do with them. And there just came a point where I got so fed up with how every, you, you have to put so much energy into every upgrade and on all of the things incompatible that you, when, you, when you're when you asking me about this, we could easily turn into, into anti-technology shakers who just their whole tribe dies out uh, because they didn't catch up with the waves. But yes, I am, I do not like the fact that the maintenance of software takes so much time, but the people who stay on the cutting edge of it, stay on the cutting edge of it. They have advantages. So yeah. it could just be that it's a. Yeah. But he, he said thing. he's a traditional artist. So I, I could see if, if digital is kind of like secondary, you use it just like, you know, Photoshop just to prepare your reference or something like that, you know, then it's yeah. like you, you really just need like the basic tools that you got 20 years ago in Photoshop. You don't need all the updates, but if you, if you're using digital for as your primary tool, like the, the updates are wonderful. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure what he means by design obsolescence though. I mean, what's the alternative there? Is it really design? Like when, once, when a company is all always making improvements and growing and, and innovating, is that like a bad thing or or I'm not quite sure. The... Sometimes sometimes companies, well, maybe maybe more than sometimes, companies do design things to make sure they're going to keep making money. The most obvious yeah. thing is printer, printers that you buy for yeah, 30 yeah, bucks yeah, yeah. and then you have to pay <laughs> way many more times that for the printer's ink. It was designed to get people hooked into this. So Yeah, yeah but, but what it, about it, like Photoshop? I mean, he uses the example of Photoshop and Blender. Like, yeah. Well, with I mean, with Adobe now, you you have a subscription uh, where you're just always getting the updates. Doesn't matter how often they come, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, but like that subscription could be expensive unless you're a professional, yeah, right. Um, but but if you're not, if you if you're not a professional and you're just using Photoshop for like preparing reference, then yeah, you could just buy a single copy of it and just use that for a very long time, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you don't works, need all the new stuff. It, if it works, I, you know, all of the recording that I do for Stan and anyone else, I do with Audacity. Audacity is not a professional program, but it's better than anything Pink Floyd ever had. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, yeah, it's like, well, oh. this, this works, and therefore I don't have to put any more energy into learning more and more, but, you know, Charlie's using Audition and everybody else's, you know, Pro uh, Logic and, and Pro Tools and all of the other professional programs. One of the best things you can do is when you find somebody in your life who loves to stay on the updates and who reads all that stuff and they don't try to do it, they just like to do it, make friends with them and exchange favors. <laughs> Some people like to to bear the burden of the new technology. Yeah. Who who's your technology dude? Who's my technology dude? Everybody like yeah, everybody, everybody on your team. Oh, on my team. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. It used to be all uh so many of my students. No, no, actually, uh there's always a little handful of students uh, who really know the software and keep up yeah. on it. And they they've been very valuable to me. But right now it's you and Charlie and and John and Sean and and anyone else who's connected with you who follows all this stuff, yeah, yeah, and Patrick and Alex and Christian, right? Patrick and Alex <laughs> and Christian, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're all great on that stuff. Okay, Juliano, hey Juliano from Brazil here. 
I would like to say that I've been following Proko for years and learned a lot from both Stan and Marshall, whose perspective course I refer back to to this day. Wait, what? That's, that's the, the perspective. Future? That's why I don't feel from that. The no, I don't feel that guilty because if you're saying, when are you going to give me a perspective course? First, go with the old one because the old one was pretty good, even though it was flawed. So, yeah, thank you, Juliano. Yeah. What a blessing you are. <sighs> Keep going. You don't feel guilty, Marshall? I do feel guilty. I'm the good. reason I'm saying I don't feel guilty is because I do feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys have inspired me to try my hand at improving art teaching online from my local Portuguese speaking Brazilian market. Good. But beginning something like that up is a kind of something like that. Up is a kind of overwhelming task. So my question is being in the very early of setting something like that up. What topic should I focus on first? Thanks for everything. All the best with Proco 2.0. Um, I mean, the fundamentals, right? <laughs> sure. But since everybody's doing that, there's another thing. You might say, what do I wish somebody had? Oh, some I wish somebody would show me how to stretch canvas or hand make watercolor. Ah, but well, Stan, how did you do it? You did it as successfully as anybody I know. How did you choose what to teach first? Well, hold on. He's improved. Oh, oh, he is talking about teaching online. Yeah. Portuguese speaking Brazilian market. Okay. I, I, for some reason, I assumed for his local. Um, if it's a, like a local thing you're starting up, I would still, fundamentals, because you're, they're getting the in-person stuff that they can't get online. Yeah. But for your, for your local Portuguese speaking Brazilian market, why is it local? Why is it anyone who's Portuguese speaking? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, online. Yeah. Well, still, though, this is uh, his this is his language, and these are his yeah. people that Got are it. which are the, the this is now. like the most commonly spoken language on in the world, right? <laughs> or is it or is it English? I don't, I don't anyway, know. Whatever. Um so I would still focus on fundamentals, man, because people are gonna come to you instead of all the English stuff that's available right now, and you need to teach them what's really important. And most online education is to beginner and intermediate students. And if you if if you do like what Marshall just said, where you just focused on materials and stretching paper and stuff, this they're, they're gonna come to you for that and they're gonna think this is what's important is like the materials you use and it's not. Uh, you could just you can experiment with materials, but the fundamentals are what you got to really teach. Yeah. Um, so I would suggest the fundamentals. Like you, you should figure out what it was that was the the most breakthrough things that you learned from all the resources that you went through, and teach that. Teach it in your way. Yeah. Um, explain it how you like to explain it. Because the thing that will separate you from any other instructor online, no matter what language you speak, because things could just be translated and you have closed captioning and stuff like that. So the thing that will separate you is the way you teach and the information you provide, the way you organize the information. And some people will just like that better than some other instructor online. So, yeah. so just be yourself, teach the way you want to teach. I have a suggestion that I'll throw in here along with that. And I agree with the teach what you want to teach, but also the fact that you've got a Portuguese speaking audience that is like your, your native audience. My, my son was mentioning to me just recently that he's getting into these 90s bands that he didn't know about when he was a kid in the 90s. But he, he mentioned how many of them were from Orange County. And I thought, I remember that. I remember the offspring was Orange County and a, a number of these others. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there is there is a sense of hey, that's our town. Those are our yeah. streets. Those are our people. When you've got people that you speak their language and they speak yours, it may be a smaller group than the worldwide market, but there is still a sense of this is our club. And so one possibility would be to say, I spend a lot of time in all of these art courses online, and you in my little club. I'm going to tell you from our. Uh, Brazilian point of view, which ones I like best and review them and point you to them and be a maven for resources. I have a former student who's been doing that. In fact, uh, she had uh, a TikTok that kind of went viral recently because she knows all of the art instruction stuff online. That's how she, that's one way she labeled herself in our community. And so if you want to know anything about art instruction online, you just go to her and she's got the answers. That's Tiffany, Tiffany LaPlanche. Uh, that's one way 
to make yourself valuable because so many of our questions are, where do you go for this? Where do you go for that? Where do you go for this? You can say, here's what I know. I focused in on this stuff. And then to my group, I can make it so that you don't have to spend the hundred hours I've spent. I can give you in a half hour or an hour what I think is the best of it with some caveats. Cool. All right. Um, Amanda Rutledge. If you had a sandwich named after you, what would it be called? And what would be on it? The apple tart? I don't know. I, I haven't really <laughs> given any thought to a sandwich. I, I feel like yours would be like a, a yogurt wrap. <laughs> you overestimate the role of yogurt in my life. <laughs> it's just every time you're it's here. It's the only you thing yogurt. you've ever seen me eat. Yeah. Except yes. uh, apples I mean, and... do you blame me? <laughs> yeah. Um, my Okay. Well, my favorite sandwich is a chicken sandwich, but I feel like if I had a sandwich named after me, I wouldn't want it to be something so common and boring. So I'm going to go with my favorite sandwich from when I was growing up. And I actually still really love it and I eat it all the time. But it's a bologna sandwich on rye bread. Uh, it's very Russian. Um, and but the bologna is. <laughs> why are we talking about this? The it's bologna. So the bologna is. Um, it's a European bologna. It's it's called doktorskaya kalbasa, and it's much more fatty than an American bologna, I think. Uh, and it's delicious. If you have a European deli near you, go go to the go, go to that place and say, "I want some Doctor Sky Kalbasa," or just say "Doctor's Bologna" or whatever, and they'll know what you're talking about. Um, I think they call it Doctor's just because like the doctor prescribes this when you're not feeling good. <laughs> really? No, they don't. But it's like oh, it'll don't. lift your spirits because it tastes so good. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that rye bread and some ketchup. I gotta Americanize it a little bit. Just a little dab of ketchup. On the bottom, yeah, I love it. Or just bolo the bologna by itself, just put it on the tongue. Great question, okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, will you invite? This is from Martin. Will you invite interview guests who do not start their career as artists, but else carpenter, engineer, I don't know, and ended up as full time artists? Or do you know anyone like that? Yeah, we had Jama on our. Whoops, yeah, what, is, what was he before? Uh, he was headed toward rocket science. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I've had a few engineers over the years. Rocket science. And Why the, does that the, sound like a fake profession? It's just like you used yeah, to because, say. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, in math and engineering. and, and yeah. I've had a few engineers, and the engineers, almost to a person, as I think back over the caricature of my engineer students, have been really good with the technical stuff. That's just where their head goes. And the biggest struggle is how do I loosen up and get wild and be daring enough to, to be creative? That's usually where their obstacles and roadblocks are. But those, those are overcomable. So a lot of engineers, what others? Any others that you observe? I know you're not around a lot of students like I've been. I mean, when I taught at Watts, it was everybody. I mean, th there there was a lot of people coming in who already had careers. I mean, there there was like half of the students were like young young people in their early twenties, some teenagers in high school still, um, and then the other half were people who are retired or almost retired and are just like getting that itch back to to draw and paint and and. Oh. They just want to do some fun stuff again. Why is it? Let's what, let's go to the motive behind this question. I, I, did you read the whole question? Yeah, I read the whole question. It was they're just asking if we're going to have guest artists like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. We need to have. I, I don't know. I, probably not. I mean, unless that's just this artist happens to be really good and we want them on the show, and they also had another career like Jama. We didn't invite him because he had. Yeah. He was a rocket scientist before he. Is because he's just a really good artist and we wanted to talk to him. So yeah, we're not going to specifically seek that out. Um, anyway, can we move, yeah. can we move on? Chris, yeah. Chris has a question. Okay. Chris says still waiting on the cliffhanger questions to be answered. What's Marshall's dream studio. Where's the rest of Stan's beard. What the <laughs> and where is Marshall's perspective course? Uh, LOL. Love the show. You guys are the best. <laughs> 
Chris, you want, to talk, you want to start with your beard, and I'll get to my studio. Or I think it's I think your my your perspective course and the rest of my beard ran away together, and they're like yeah. having an affair together. Or well, we'll see what comes of the affair. Did, there may be some really good things. From yeah, it. they're gonna come back with some babies, some rock stars. Yeah, you never know. It's gonna be a really hairy perspective course. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Big, hairy, audacious goal is one of those things in motivational uh, psychology that helps you. Uh, okay. God, Chris. But wait, well, there was one more in there. And I don't think actually one other person asked about our dream studios and you, you didn't answer that one. And now you skipped it again this time. What, no, I'm, I'll, I'll, I can. What's your dream studio, Marshall? Well, it, when, am I supposed to describe the floor plan and the layout? Let me tell you. No, you describe what is important to you about oh, this dream I studio. I can tell you what's important the, to me in my dream studio. If the floor plan is no, important. it's not the floor plan. Then the don't floor, describe the floor plan. Wait, the floor, floor plan is important, but to describe <laughs> it isn't quite the thing. Here's, I'd start with great big stuff. One is this, that I would design my uh, ideal studio. The way I've tried to design anything that I want it to be good, I take into account what sets of opposites. For example, if I'm sitting down and working at a computer, I'm sitting down and I've got artificial light. So it may be that the next thing that I do is to go for a walk by natural light and that I'm around green. And then if I'm going to come back in and be an artificial light, it might be good to be standing up. So I would I would divide into categories what kind of light, artificial or natural. I would also divide into categories whether it's bright or dull. Uh, down at uh, at the San Diego studio when we were doing TAD uh, it, in the, the Lemon studio, we had a a little room that was like a cubby hole where we had a screen where not that many of us could get together and watch movies. And there was something so wonderful about having a theater that is dark and the light comes up and you go into this other world. Uh, I, I hate watching movies in a room with light on. It just destroys the effectiveness of the dream. But, yeah. but here's another one, claustrophobia, or not claustrophobia, but enclosed spaces. And open spaces are another set of opposites. Uh, plants, which I never knew were important. I work in my patio in the back as much as I can now to where I'm just trying to arrange my life to where I wanted to do this podcast out there today because just there's something about being around that kumquat yeah. tree and the, the persimmon <laughs> tree and the <laughs> apple tree and all these bushes. That's what I would first concern myself with is what are the different activities? What are the different kinds of light? What's the different kind of space feel like? How much of it is standing up? How much of it is sitting down? And to arrange those so that the day within its unity, one day, has a great deal of variety built into it. I don't know whether that was a good answer, but I it's mean, the it one on my mind. Yeah, that's interesting. So you, yours is a lot about the light and just kind of the feeling of the environment and if whether you're sitting or standing, <laughs> right? I'm sitting yeah. in an environment right here where two people couldn't even fit, <sighs> like an airplane yeah. cockpit. And I designed it that way, partly out of necessity, but also it makes it so that when I step out of here, I feel like I've gone, I really get the feeling of being outdoors. And I started to realize I'm, in, I'm teaching so many classes from that studio that I don't really want to go in there for other reasons. But occasionally, late at night, when I'm setting stuff up in here, the fact that I've got four monitors in front of me, and this is all enclosed, there's a feeling of the mad scientist in his laboratory that makes me feel really good about it. Hmm. So there is the other thing besides the opposites and polarities and differences and balances of the day is what do yeah. you secretly see your studio as? And I, I made a list that I spent about a year or two. It was about when, when I met you of studio as laboratory, studio as, uh, as uh, radio broadcasting uh, room, uh, studio as playground, studio as think tank, uh, all of these other things to see which ones felt good. And then as time went on, I thought some of these would be better not to be in a studio. But here's another one. Privacy and community would be a major one. I want the places where I can go in to be safe, 
to brainstorm any idea, whether alone or with yeah. someone who's a trusted collaborator, where it's a no judgment place and private. That's important that it's not being looked in on by people who can bring in uh, bad energy. And then the opposite of that, to go out into community and interact with other people. And it's a very different temperament, personality, energy. You just t you take on a different vibe. So that would be another thing that I'd care much about is where is this alone and protected? And where is this outside and interacting? Those are, yeah. I know those are big general abstract things, but right now no, it's I've, important. I've got a file full of ideal environments. That's it's a paper file. I've turned some of it into digital where I was trying to design perfect studios when I was a college student. And I've got a whole bunch of them. A lot of them tend to be around round things where you've got a hub in the middle where people come together and then there's the different pockets of the rooms around them. One of them over here on the left side of the circle is for generating ideas. One over here on the right side of the circle is for refining them. So I don't have any one, but uh, they take money to really turn them into what you want. So yeah, let's move on. I think I've said more than I need to say on that. Well, here, since two people have already asked, let me try to... How do I do this? Okay. I'm going to see if I could even do this. Attempt to. I trust you because you are a competent. Oh, jeez. A competent. I'm, I'm trying to use this camera here. to show the studio. Oh, so, what a great, what a so great this is, thing you've oh, got. Geez. That's wonderful. Ah, the, court, the cables up here are, are stuck. But anyway, this is what I see in front of me right now. So I got the camera pointed at me, got the TV with all the stuff. Um, but I got one really important thing for me is space, lots of space, because I don't like feeling claustrophobic. I have mostly things on the outsides. I got my books over here and you know, these are sound panels. That's a sound panel. That's a sound panel back there. Sound panel, sound panel. And I, they, they're all on wheels. See? And so when I, I'm not recording. I just put them against the wall and I have lots of space in the middle to do whatever. I like to be able to, to get up and, and, and just like, you know, stretch a big canvas if I want to, or, or whatever it is, film something. Um, but, oh geez, switch back to Marshall. I'm going to try to put this back. Yeah. Uh, with, with studios, what is this for? How do you view it with your secret identity of what it is? And, uh, get what you do out on paper to where you can see how things balance each other out. I'm, I'm quite happy with this little corner of a room for, for teaching classes, but I've got other things in preparation for doing demos and other stuff that has to be worked on, but it's always changing. It depends on the task. A studio for producing art is a completely different thing than a studio for teaching online classes. They overlap, but they are two very different things. Uh. <laughs> well, the sound of you clicking things is kind of asthma. <laughs> it's not going back on. It's okay. I feel like the child feels knowing that the grown-up is over there making clicking sounds. I can hear the sound of dishes being washed, ah. so I know there's well, a grown-up taking care of things. That means well, I can this be the kid. camera's not going back on. Just anyway, let my mind okay, I'm going to read over the place. I'm going to read the next question while I hold this camera because it. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then I'll try to take it. Okay. Cause ahead. it won't hook up to the tripod. Um, where is it? Uh, Marshall, if you were a superhero, what would be your theme song? Can you sing it for us? Like right now? <laughs> no. They, come on. Sing your theme song. Okay. You, 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 figure, up. you figure out your camera and, uh, and you figure out your theme song. Hey, if you really are interested in, in songs and theme songs, and you know anyone who is a professional songwriter who wants to put together a course and have me be their servant to help all of this stuff. I've been a fan of songwriters since I was a little kid, and I would love to know more uh, about how songs get written. But there's a rule for people in the class as participants. You have to be willing to uh, improvise songs and make them stupid. But I am not one who will sing on demand on the live podcast about the superhero song when I haven't given it thought yet. You gotta get me in a relaxed and safe mode. Now, okay. 
What's and your that's... theme song? Ah, let's have you do a little My clip of it song. and put it well, on. I don't sing. I don't. I've never even come up with a song. So this okay. is okay. Hey, weird. did you? Fix your... You didn't ask me. I did. Yeah, I hooked it up. I hooked okay. it up. I hooked it up. Okay. It's let's go to there. the next question. See, there it is. It's up there. Hey, there okay. it is. <laughs> um, well, David Finch drew me. Wait, did, by the way, did you see David Finch's drawing I, of us as superheroes? I saw the. I, I skimmed through it. I didn't have time to watch the whole thing, but I was so. Yeah, no, but pleased. did you see the end, the final drawing? Yeah, I did. Wasn't that amazing? Oh, he made he made us look awesome. Did you hear the part where he we talk about what our superpowers are? No. What is my superpower? Oh, I want to know. So your superpower is distorting perspective. Okay. So your name is Mister Distort. Okay. And my superpower is I shoot armies of quick sketches out of my hands and they attack people. Little quick sketches just like oh wow. Fight you. They're little. Uh yeah. What a privilege to and be. And you're a villain. Drawn. I'm a villain. Yeah. Oh wow. You're not that a superhero marshal. Sense of the id. Yeah, if you guys missed that stream, go watch the replay. It was really, 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 really good. If you're interested interested in comic books, especially, go check it out. That was quite quite a stream. But we're privileged to have David Finch do this. Yeah, and he also just released a new course. Well, it's a pre-sale for his course. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's up for sale now, so go check it out. Pocket.com slash something. Um, uh, Jao Bogo Marshall, if you were a superhero... No, that was the same question. Sorry. Uh, Felicia, good day to you both. Have you ever been through an artistic burnout? And if so, mm. what are the signs that you pay attention to now in order to prevent it from happening again? Mm. Along the same lines, if you had to push yourself to remain disciplined, how would you know the difference between when you're simply overcoming laziness and when you're actually straining yourself? Mm. Interesting. Well, that's somebody asking that question out of some motive of concern for it. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, what, uh, give me the phrasing of the question again. <laughs> what? Uh, it's, it's, how do you, how do you the, watch for it? The how whole do you thing prepare was, for it? Uh, what are the signs you pay attention to in order to prevent it from happening? the signs you pay attention to is that it starts affecting your life negatively in a number of ways. And you can say, I'm working too hard and it's hurting me. So yeah, the signs yeah. become obvious. Hey, I'm going to share screen. Okay. Go I'm going to share screen. screen Go to Marshall's full screen. I want to show, give me a moment here, share screen. Do, this, John, go to, go to Marshall, John. This last Friday, can you see this? There you go. Oh, Cool. Perfect. Yes. This last Friday, I interviewed Dr. Eddie O'Connor, who I talk about constantly because I so admire his book. Let's see. Are we seeing the whole, uh, there we go. Seeing the whole yeah. thing. Psychology performance. He has a chapter in here that is a sobering chapter called burnout and the need for recovery. But I recommend that before you read this chapter in mm. the guidebook that you can get for free, if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash draftsman, before you read this, prepare yourself for some, some feelings, because it's a scary chapter of the damage that burnout can do. And he talks about Burnout as something has been studied and understood and has distinct stages with distinct symptoms. Um, so are you going to the scientific approach to what burnout is, is, is uh, about and how it can be overcome and how it can be avoided? So don't go to me for that question. Go to someone who is a clinical sports psychologist who has studied it and worked with people. And in that chapter, you have a ton of stuff that will keep you busy. Now, in the what are those symptoms of burnout? Are they mostly mental or are they physical? Oh, they're both. They're both. Okay. I've got the. Uh, if I open this up to, uh, I'm I'm not sure that I want to take the time to really work this through. But uh, give me just here it is. I found the chapter. Uh, burnout and the need for recovery, mm -hmm. and. It's lecture 17 of 24 lectures. I've got it marked up like crazy. 
He's got charts on here to show how it is understood that one part of it, physical parts of it and emotional and psychological parts of it are connected to the physical part of it. And there is a cycle that has been studied about burnout that, you know, you're asking me a question that I don't really know how to win it, uh, wing this, except to say, look, you've got access to that chapter in a PDF for free at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash draftsman for 14 days. You can download the PDF. You'll have the whole thing and, and you can live in one of the, one of the richest sources of content for people who consider their work any kind of performance and read the chapter on burnout. Yeah. I love, I love how you're like, look, he's got charts in here. As if to show, like, see, this is scientific. <laughs> He's got charts. Uh, the, the scientific, <laughs> the, the charts are the results of having seen one person after another whose life is damaged and saying, hey, before that stage of the damage yeah. that can't be undone, you will see this, this, you will hear the car making loud sounds before the engine burns out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the reason I ask if it's physical or mental is personally, I've never had like a mental burnout, mm -hmm. but I've had physical burnout where the stress and long hours give me like headaches mm -hmm. and I just get like exhausted and I just need yeah. to like get some sleep. But it, the, the burnout is always kind of short term. I've never gone through. I, I think when people ask about burnout, it's more, it's kind of like a longer burnout where like they just f lose motivation right and, and this can last for months the, yeah. bur the only burnouts i've experienced are just the ones where i just needed like a weekend to recover and just like stop working because my my body just needs to rest from all the stress uh, that's what that's why i place such a high premium on varied activities yeah that if yeah. you do something for two or three hours a day you're unlikely to get burned out on it uh, but if you do somebody said uh, or here, here, here's what some research has shown. We overestimate what we can do in the short run. Mm -hmm. We underestimate what we can do in the long run if we do it consistently, 15 minutes yeah. a day, an hour a day, or two hours a day, because it accumulates. Mm -hmm. So that principle can be a game changer for how you arrange your time. And I'll say one more thing. The interview that I got to do with Dr. Eddie on Friday, I'm happy with that interview. And it will be on Draftsman probably in, in July. And he said some things in there that I think you'll find really valuable. But I don't want to steal his thunder. Uh, he got very passionate at some things about what goes wrong with people's uh, lifestyles that throws it off. So you've got that to look forward to for free by way of Draftsman. Nice. <laughs> And one of our sponsors, thegreatcoursesplus.com. I don't know whether this counts as a commercial or not. No, it does. They didn't pay oh, for it. Yeah. I guess it can count as a free sponsor. We're, yeah, we're sponsoring this ourselves. Yeah, sponsored by Proco 2.0. Yeah. Um, What's next? How are we doing on time? We've been over an hour into this. We're well, an hour and 20 eight, minutes almost. Yeah, we'll go for another 40 minutes. We'll hit the two-hour mark, and then we'll be done. Okay. We got a lot of comments. Uh, nope. I'm seeing 44 messages from uh, the Slack, the Slack that I haven't gotten to yet. Is is uh, uh, is John sorting <laughs> through them for what he thinks are I hope worthy so. ones? I told him to send the best ones. Hey, John or or Mike, whoever's actually putting, I think Mike is doing it as well. But um, can you guys pin? Because we're we're definitely not going to be able to get through all of those. Um, can you guys pin the ones that you really uh, that really stand out so that I could kind of skip through to those? Um, I'll see the ones you pin in the Slack chat. So, hey, uh, Mike's another but, guy who helps me with technology. Yeah, of course. Everybody Mike's, on the Proco team. Mike's a smart dude. He is. Um, Modern Day James and Steven Zapata are watching. Nice. Hi, up, Modern guys? Day James and Steven nice. Zapata. Yeah, Steven actually just released a new course on Proco.com today. Oh, <laughs> it's about Ooh. sketch. Oh, and a free video on Proco.com. A free video, well. too. A free video as well. We are um, privileged here. The course, I believe, is called Secrets of Shading. Secrets of Shading. Secrets Good of shading. title. And yeah. And today's free video from him was about 
shading from imagination. All right. So I'm pretty sure that's like something everyone's interested in. So go ahead yeah. and stop this stream and go watch. Yeah. <laughs> Steve. No, I'm just kidding. Stop. You Dude, got wait wait till this is done. Then go watch Steven's video. Um, and then Modern James said in the chat, he'll do a music course stream thing with you, Marshall. <laughs> hey. Will you sing? Modern day James? Yeah, well, he he can't. He's not. His oh, audio is not yeah, here. Yeah, but audio, yeah. yeah, modern James or James. <laughs> James, will you uh, reply and say, yes, you will sing or not? I assume he does only instruments, but maybe not. Maybe he sings. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're yeah. the singer and he's going to. I think he plays okay. guitar, right? Oh, yeah. I, I, I miss right. when we during Tad. Uh, we used to get together and sing. We sang Beatles songs. I've oh, he few... sang with you? No, no, he didn't. But with oh, students, oh. Uh, okay. you, you have to get if you get one student or two or three students that, that play instruments. John Nymeister used to bring in his cello to uh, the studio, and we would sing. It was it was great. I miss it. Nice. Well, maybe maybe we could do a, a music thing. We'll see. Hours. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if Steven yeah. Sondheim's still available to coach us or Marty Panzer okay. or somebody else who's got a class in songwriting. Oh, I see a bunch of pin stuff now. Okay. okay. Danny says, who is Marshall's most famous student? Oh, don't no. To, don't don't answer do, that. No, I don't want to do that. Anyone he didn't, he's not going to mention is just going to feel left out. Come on. Yeah, he, that's right. Marshall also, has like a hundred famous students. Like yeah. it, it really, like th this is probably not even an exaggeration, right? Like there's so many of them have gone on to be professionals and everybody knows about them yeah. now that like. And what would kinda, be the point of, of what would be the yeah. point of singling out somebody? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say Norman Rockwell, George Bridgman, uh, Banksy, uh, Beeple. And uh, the Beatles are his most famous students. My most famous teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Beeple is your most famous teacher? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. You don't Beeple. even know who that is. No. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Someone's calling me. I hope it's not someone from the not team with an emergency. With a, uh, emergency information that we haven't been broadcasting no. and we thought it's we were. Unknown number. You're not important enough, unknown number. <sighs> calling again. Well, maybe they are important. Okay. Um, people want you to know they love Marshall's garbage truck and wish it would make an appearance. Yeah, I know I know that. Marshall's the only one that doesn't understand how amazing the garbage truck is and how it is a character it is the third host of the podcast. But guys, today is not garbage truck day. Today That's is right. Monday. We usually right. film film our podcast episodes on Wednesdays. That's right. This is Monday, so That's unfortunately, right. no garbage truck today. For 21 um, years of my life, Tuesday was garbage truck day. When Tuesday. it switched to Wednesday, it threw my whole life off. Mine is Thank Friday. Mine, well, mine is Wednesday through you and Friday. This is a Friday. great idea. Let's have a community where everybody says what day is their <laughs> garbage truck day. <laughs> and then the, they stream during that day. Mm -hmm. So it's always garbage truck day somewhere. And share photographs. We can use them in the perspective course. <laughs> my God, this is something my son would just watch all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He watches garbage truck videos on YouTube. Oh, oh God. Great. Okay. Hi, Marshall Stan. Thank you so much for everything you do. I learned so much thanks to you. Do you have an opinion about how other cultures compared to Amer American art teaching? Do you think other traditions are mostly similar? Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, French, etc.? Or are there some key differences? Do you think there are specific things where a particular culture is better at? For example, if you want to learn X, look at this specific country. Thank you again. Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know much about, you know, I, I know about like the Russian art schools, um, some of the European ones. Um, I know that the difference with the Russian Academy, like the Repin Academy, is that they don't draw they don't demonstrate nearly as much as like in american art schools where it's like you're pretty like the teacher is pretty much just like uh expected to be demoing half of the time and then when you walk around you're supposed to sit and like actually 
mar you know, draw on the person's stuff and demonstrate to them what they need. I think, I mean, the, the people that I've talked to said that at the Russian Academy, they just walk around and they give you verbal advice because they want you to fix it on your own. You have to figure out how to fix it. And so they just, they just kind of guide you with words. Um, that, that, that's one big difference. Um, yeah, Marshall, what about you? What, what do you There's no about? question that different countries and different cultures and different states in the U.S. are going to have different strengths yeah. for what they train you in. And that's always been all through history, but I just don't know enough about it. I hear people tell me about it. Um, it's even different school to school within an area. Yeah. So there's no question, yeah. but I'm just not, I don't have enough authority to say anything about it. I probably know more about it, how the, the Florentines discovered perspective and so many other things. And then Albrecht Durer brought it to Germany. And then from Germany, it went to Spain and France and everywhere else. And in the, you, you see it with music too. You see how much of it was German and Austrian and then got the, the European evolution of music. And then by the time early 20th century, the French and Russians. Oh gosh, Russian music has been a huge deal in my life in the last month or two because I've had a number of Russian students in <laughs> month these... or two. You always talk about Russian music. But are you they're... talking about Russian classical composers or like Russian well, like people folk would call music. them classical composers, but technically they are late rom romantic and late romantic. Do you know? You don't know Prokofiev and Rachmaninoff and Mussorgsky. I do. And the... Well, no, I know not not all those. Pro Prokofiev for sure, because I I kept getting his. I, <laughs> do you know results. Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C, C sharp minor? It's, yeah, it's no, I could wait. Let, Stan, let, say that you, again. Say it again. Say it again. I'll make Rachmaninoff, sure Prelude in C sharp minor, is one of the most famous pieces of what people call classical music in the world. Did you say C sharp minor? Yes. You would recognize it probably from the beginning. A bum bum bum. I'm going to click octaves. on it. Hopefully people can't hear it. It's going to be in my headphones. But... Okay. But that is one piece of music. Oh, Duh. Every, every junior higher and high school, every middle school and high school falls in love with it because it is an awesome piece of music. But it's not, it's not his only one. He did the prelude in G minor, which you do not want to miss that. You don't want to miss a number of these. This is late 19th century into the 20th century, into about the 40s, where these great, most of the great performers, well, many of the great performers, in the U.S. And, and elsewhere were Russian pianists. So there was this surge of energy that the Russians have this, it was sort of a, uh, of an echo of Beethoven, really forceful, really strong images of boatmen, you know, pulling things and but with this light, delicate beauty to balance it. It's just great stuff. It is worth, Man. it is worth a, a, a decade of your life, even if you're not Russian, you're Russian. You should be knowing this stuff and exulting in the fact that that musical tradition yeah. also came to Hollywood and it affected uh, Prokofiev's music. I'm listening to a YouTube video. And it's it's Rachmaninoff, Prelude in C sharp minor. Yeah. Op three, number two, whatever. I don't know. Prelude in, he only did one Prelude in C sharp minor. But but I'm listening. This is a, an amazing video. The way they film this, it's like the the notes are coming down and they're hitting the keyboard. And, and and when they hit the keyboard, little smoke comes out of them. It's such a great video. Uh, it's the it's Rousseau is the YouTube video YouTube channel that this is on. It's okay. I gotta stop it. Okay. It, well, I, I wandered off. The the topic was yeah. which art schools, uh, which which countries have art schools. That I don't know yeah. enough about it to tell you. I will tell you that there is a difference. And so if you ask around people who know more. If somebody knows more, be a maven to us. Let us know. I've heard stories about how the Koreans train. And I've heard stories about how in India, how you've got this gauntlet that you've got to get through to be able to be accepted into, into any schools. There's all sorts of stories that I'm hearing, but yeah, it's, a, it's somebody else got to answer it and get off of the subject of Russian composers and performers. Um, okay, from Saurabh. Hi, Stan Marshall. Can you tell a little about how you actually practice and self-correct during learning of fundamentals of art? Most of the videos are about learning it, but no one actually tells how to self-correct or practice it. I did actually have in my figure drawing class um, one lesson. I think it was on exaggeration. Or, or was it on exaggeration? <laughs> I forgot which one it was. About how to self-correct. Um, 
You did a whole was, video was on it. it on, I think it might have been on proportions or something. You Shoot. did a video on growth too, how to maximize growth mm -hmm. and how much of it was the feedback loop. You've talked about that as much as anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. done it. But I mean, for, there's a lot of different things that you can self correct on. One thing that people struggle with a lot are like proportions, right? And stuff like that, mechanical stuff, you can self correct. Like you, you don't need someone to look at your stuff and tell you if your proportions are wrong. You could. From a photo, this you ha this has to be from a photo, but that's fine for proportions. You get a photo out, you try to draw it as accurate as you can, and then you scan your drawing, not take a photo of it so that you know it's not skewed anyway. You scan yeah. it so it's exactly how you drew it, and then you overlay your drawing over the photo in Photoshop or whatever, and you can see exactly where your proportions were off. Um, that that's you don't need a teacher to do that, and it's you show you see exactly where you're off. Um, and you keep doing that. You, you keep checking and, and, you know, do 30 minutes and do an hour. Um, and, and then if do it again, that's, a, that's a huge part of it is if you did a drawing, you saw some things were off, start with a clean piece of paper again, draw it again and try to remember what you did wrong last time and do it correctly this time. Um, and that's how you can get your pr proportions correct. But there's so many other things like shading and gesture and some of those things are a little bit more difficult to check. Um, but with my with my figure drawing course, the way I've organized it is that I give you a lesson, I give you an assignment and I tell you to try it on your own first. Yeah. Do this by yourself. Then watch my example videos where I do the same gesture drawing as you because you were drawing from the same poses. And then you can check your work based on my example drawings. A, a lot of people I know because they submit the, their drawings and, and I'll see that it's really just a copy of my example. It's not a gesture drawing from the photo. It's a gesture drawing from my gesture drawing. And that's not, that's not how you're going to learn. You need to, the, the difficult part about gesture is solving it, looking at a photo of a real person and drawing it as a gesture. That's the problem you're trying to solve. And so, um, my example videos are there to help you self-correct. So you could look at your gesture, look at mine, compare, move on to the next one. Um, yeah, but pro Marshall. proportion is such an easy, it's an easy way to objectify whether it's right or wrong. Yep. So st starting with proportion makes sense. Now, but the, the general advice is a great big advice, which is summed up in that first or second chapter of the talent code about the girl who was trying to learn violin or who was, was learning to play her violin. Do you remember that Stan? That she um, play a passage and it would yeah. be, it would have something wrong. And so she'd correct it or move in the direction, correct it. And then it would have something wrong and she'd correct it. And it was like a simple thing. Well, that's so obvious that he said, he essentially boils it down to that is the paradigm for all growth is that you, you adjust as it goes wrong. In fact, Stan, I would like to, since we read the talent code sort of together, I would love to read it again and do a podcast around the lessons in that. I, I've thought about it a number of times and while yeah. we're, we're doing this, that might be one worth, worth taking a look at. Yeah, it might be. We could, we could try that. Okay, self-correction, <laughs> yeah. feedback loop, yeah. major theme with Stan. Yeah. Another good one that you could correct yourself on is anatomy. I, that, I mean, that's how I, most of my anatomy was learned. I took a few anatomy classes and had instructors give me feedback, but that was many, many years ago. I've, everything after that was self-correcting through, you know, I have a photo, I try it on my own, and then I get out um, Goldfinger and Roche, and I look at diagrams, which are like, they're like your answers right there. And you think, okay, did I do that correctly? Did I, did I, uh, did I, analyze this photo correctly do i remember where the muscles are attaching was that i you know basically when you're looking at a photo you have to observe the bumps and you have to know what they mean in when you draw it anatomically but then you can get out a diagram and see if you forgot a muscle that was there or it's like oh that bump is this one here because it's attached to this landmark or whatever so anatomy is another good one you can easily self-correct yeah anything that's objective yeah anything yeah. that's measurable math science well, perspective is a little difficult, isn't it? Uh, perspective, but can be done. The, the problem with most people with perspective is that it changes so much when the camera is in close and the camera is far back. Yeah. And 
And because that is seldom addressed with any thoroughness in perspective books, it's usually addressed, but not with the thoroughness that somebody like Kim Jong Gi understands. With you know, he he hardly even says that he studied perspective. He studied the box, but then if you can do the wide angle and and yeah, telephoto lens, flattening the box by getting distant from it, spreading it out by getting close to it, and knowing how the vanishing points affect it, that is where the lack of objectivity is most an issue. Is it are the vanishing points in the right place? Yeah. Well, what is the right place? It just depends. It depends on where, how close you are and where it is in relationship to your view. So that's why yeah. perspective is harder than proportion. So much of perspective is being able to judge angles correctly. It's all about angles. Those subtle, subtle, they have to be pointing at the same vanishing point together. Like there's a, in a box, there's three lines that have to, all three of them have to line up to get, to vanish to a point. Um, and you could, I guess, draw from a photo of a box and then overlay your drawing onto the box. And that that could be useful. Yeah. That's yes, that is a good one. It's kind of like the same as the proportions thing. You're still you you are kind of practicing proportions, but you're also mostly focused there on angles. And that's a huge skill that's required for perspective. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. Um <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. At what point in an artist's development do you think he or she should reduce their focus on the fundamentals, obvi obviously without totally abandoning them, and start focusing on a personal style? Um, thanks so much to you both. You're the best, especially Stan. Interesting. <sighs> it's like asking, <laughs> you know, what age should you you choose to go through adolescence uh, uh it, well, it kind of happens when what? It, it, you it's it's something that happens from within it's that i feel well, like i need more of this i your your body will go through adolescence and you will find your style as you're working on fundamentals by what is style it's the way you draw yeah and, you prefer one way over another way by looking at how different people do it and picking up bits of style. But it can come very naturally if you're just doing the work. I, I don't know. I don't know. The question was, at what point? Yeah. At what point? 30 um, of the way through is the point that you should start. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a point. That's that is a problem, huh? It's like it's a big transition, and it, that transition could last a very long time. And they could never, it might never really ever go from one to the other. You might still have a little bit of fundamentals study in twenty years from now, right? And but you're just a little more focused on on style. I, the question. I don't think there's a point. The the, the the person who asked this question, why are you asking it? Are you afraid that if you start working on style, you'll neglect the fundamentals? Are you figuring I'll have a better style if I think about style for a while longer? Uh, one way is just collect the art parents whose styles that you like and keep them in front of you and you tend to gravitate toward you look what you look at. And uh, study I, the I, fundamentals from them. Yeah, yeah. They, they, that's the reverse way of, of going about it, but it's legitimate. Take masters that you like, try to imitate them and then say, I can't do it. My stuff just doesn't look as good as theirs. And then the question is why? And the question will often be because I don't know light on form and I don't know this and that and these other fundamentals that I must know. But I've mentioned this before. How did you pick up your dialect? How did you pick the, up the way you speak? It's because you watch TV shows and listen to people and had family members and you picked up their rhythms. So the artwork around you that you choose that you like will affect your style for better and worse. But style is something that perhaps, perhaps a third or a, a halfway through your general training that you can consciously start saying, I want to work in this style more. But I have seen it work fine the other way around, that you start with a style and you're locked into that early. I want to do comic book characters of this style. I want to do anime of this style. And then as you want to make it better and better, you seek out those fundamentals after you've chosen the style. Yeah, I, I am I'm not happy huge. with my answer, but what do you add to this? I, I totally agree. I'm huge on personal projects. 
And so if if you are really excited about like what Marshall said, just you know, doing some did you say manga characters or what? <laughs> yeah, what whatever, whatever you love. Whatever it is. Yeah, you're really into some some very, very specific thing and you want to do uh work on a project where you're doing this, do that. Even if you're not ready for it. Go work on personal projects and balance that out with all the boring studying stuff. Um, because that will inform what you need to study. And then when you study, you then can apply it to real projects that you're excited about. And that study stuff will stick better because you now applied it in real life to a real thing that you're really excited about. Um, and so the two have to balance out. You know, it's Stan. It's not a point where you switch. Yeah, I got a, I got a way to answer this question and plug my teaching this summer. What? Yeah, yeah. I've got a way to answer it. Can I share yeah. screen? Yes. Okay. This summer, starting, starting, uh, starting this Saturday, starting in just whatever it is, four days here, uh -huh. I am doing this composition workshop and it will be three months. Let me show you how much time we're going to spend in here. We are going to spend June, July, and August in the composition bootcamp. You say, what does this have to do with style? Composition and style have a, have things in common, which is that you you develop a style of composing. Here is one student's projects from, we just did this for the last three months, and we've taken a break. Now we're going to start it. So if you mm -hmm. want to study composition with me this summer, I'm going to put you on Two things. One is exercises. Exercises are things like memory drawings and master studies. This is an example of a student's memory drawings where you have to do these five or six times a week, 15 minutes and no more from memory. Jay did these marvelous ones, but I want to show you his first ones. Uh, they were They evolved from this to where he got a style. Ruby did these. Now, those are exercises. You don't really get much product out of them. Master studies are where you choose masters you like, and you study them for their elements. And so many students choose masters that are hot and happening and working in the game industry. I want to show you what Nino Lobo did. This is a final uh, project. Uh, one of 12 uh, originals that were assigned for the the three months we did. And it didn't start out that way. I'm having students start out with what we call reveries, where you just do mm -hmm. abstracts. And then see if you can push them further. And then say, have I pushed them too far? If I push them too far, in this case, cacophony, clutter, energy, it's just overwhelming. Can I, instead of pulling it back, find one area that does the opposite? And then somewhere about eight, eight, nine weeks into it, we're looking for lines of continuity and a line drawing that leads to a finished piece like this. Look at that style. That is so unlike what everybody in the game industry is doing, what so many people in, in a number of uh, popular industries are doing. And it's so unlike Michelangelo's work and Howard Pyle's and others, but it's got the same principles going. So here's what I am suggesting for style. If you want to study composition with me this summer, I will put you onto session two, choose touchstones from nature that excite you. Study them purely in terms of elements and you can post a slide. And when you say, I want a style that feels like gems, that feels like minerals, that feels like translucent colored rocks, then it puts you into chasing these. We, we didn't have resources like this. Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth and Rembrandt and Da Vinci didn't have resources like this where they could type into Google and get the world's colored rocks. You will, Ruby put this together, her, her love of Persian rugs, tree branches, and marking informations of crystals. Now watch, I'm going somewhere with this. Then doing what we call reveries. Reveries are where you just mess around. It's somewhere between an exercise and a project. You mess around 
and make abstract designs. And these are based, in fact, she even said that these ones she did while uh, in response to these Persian rugs. And as you find abstract designs you like, you're doing this not just to create abstract designs. It is to extract from the natural phenomena that you want to inject into your drawing styles. Jenny choosing trees and clouds. She chose a bunch of things. Then doing studies from them and it will result not only in abstractions, but watch this. Morgan Rayner, uh, here's Jay doing his, where he would take a, a phenomenon, then oh, do a cool. little abstract work out of it and start to turn it into something that is more representational. Morgan did this, abstract design, and then two results out of it that I was thrilled with. She was happy with them too. Wait, the, which she's two? Got, representational oh, the pieces. Finals. Yeah, these two. This this one right here uh -huh. and this one here. Now, those came out of collecting stuff by running around and taking photos. We've got photo quests, master studies, memory drawings, and reveries that result in originals. And the originals, you know, they can be they can be mm -hmm. uh, photography, like Vera Golosova, who's really wow. was just great with the camera. Aren't those beautiful? And that's because this summer, if you study composition with me, I will have you put 20 hours over three months. That's 20 minutes a day, five days a week of walking around with total concentration with your cell phone camera and observing the world through a rectangle. And there aren't any rules, really. This is to give 20 hours and three months of seeing the world through a rectangle, which is a part, a basic part of composing. Now, all of that is to say that if you're going to get involved with me in the next three months, sign up this week. It's really cheap. I am charging as little as I can for the eavesdropper tier of this, 120 bucks for 24 hours of lessons over three months. That's my sales pitch for this summer's composition course. and. I hope it answers a little bit of what you're seeking for when do you work on style. If you're studying composition, which is an aesthetic choice, you cannot say my composition is 88% good or 95% accurate. You can say I like it or not. There's going to be people who listen to Rachmaninoff's Preludes in C-sharp minor say, no, 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 it's too aggressive. So it's a subjective thing. But since composition is, by its nature, an emotional call, so is style. And so that is a good time to be working on style by choosing stylistic uh, touchstones and masters. Cool. Long pitch, but we were sponsoring, yeah. so we're it's sponsoring this course. Martialart.com? Is yes. that where they sign if up? If you go to martialart.com on the front page, you'll see the composition boot camp, and you've only got a few days. So sorry it's so yeah. time intensive. Do it now. Yeah. Uh, my wife just texted, and she said that they're watching it. They're watching the stream at home. It's my my father-in-law's birthday. Oh, happy well, birthday. happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday Father's Day. to <laughs> Melissa's yeah. dad. Yeah. And they're watching me as if I'm there with them. Can't, yeah. Family hey, Cooper. Time. Hey, Quinn. Hey, Ariana <laughs> and Ashton. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, okay. KJ Man says, hey, Stan and Marshall, I'm currently in a position where I feel like I could benefit from much needed critiques, but I don't really have any connections with people that could provide that. Do you have any suggestions for online communities or any ways that I could seek out my own flaws in my drawings? For example, gesture drawings. <laughs> I'm pretty sure... Mike pasted this into Slack because it's an obvious pitch for Proco.com. KJ, man, come on, man. We just launched Proco 2.0. Yeah. That, 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 that's the whole point of that is community and getting critique. So go, go there, post your stuff, get some feedback, and then help others as well. Give it back. You know, get critique, help others with stuff that you're good at. All right. Um, Nicholas says, hi, Marshall. What is your opinion on the Da Vinci sleep schedule? He used to sleep 20 minutes every four hours. A similar schedule was followed by Nikola Tesla. And how is your sleeping schedule? Well, I've talked about my sleeping schedule too much. And on the uh, episode, the uh, draftsman episode with Eddie O'Connor, I'm going to mention it again. 
I love sleep and I've slept, <laughs> slept a lot and yeah. uh, it's important to me, but it's, it's a topic we'll take up later. Yeah. I I've heard of that sleep schedule and there was a guy, a, a blogger I used to follow uh, Steve Pavlina and he no. did a whole year of this schedule where he tried it. And I think the conclusion to what his experiment was that he felt great. Like, like after the first, like, I don't know, month or two of, having his body adapt to this new sleep schedule after that he, he was adapted he was fine and he felt great he was obviously he he didn't sleep nearly as much as he was when he was doing one sleep shift per day describe it i didn't understand that 20 minutes every what every four hours you sleep for 20 minutes and you do that forever you, you never have like an eight hour cycle you sleep for 20 minutes then you're awake for four hours sleep for 20 minutes, awake for four hours. And that's, you, you only end up sleeping. I don't remember how, what that adds up to, but it's a much, much less than eight hours a day. And you have the same amount of energy, whatever. I don't know what the science is behind it, but the conclusion to that experiment to him was that he felt fine. He was very productive, mentally, no effect, uh, physically, no effect. He felt great, but huge social consequences. He couldn't like he had a family and he, <laughs> like he had to if they're out and like like my family, we went to Legoland yesterday. Like if he has to take a nap every four hours, he has to go out to the parking lot and sleep in the car while his family's at Legoland for 20 minutes and then come back. Um, you know, it, it's just weird. Like socially, it's just really difficult and challenging. And to him, he stopped it because he, his social life was important to him. And it, it was just too much of a hassle to do that sort of thing so you anyway. also might want to consult with someone who knows the research too yeah because anything that's got a title on it like the da vinci sleep schedule sounds like a marketing thing <laughs> it sounds yeah. like a a, a, a cult I, I i wouldn't trust it until i heard more from people yeah. who i would trust but there's alternatives to that you don't have to go all the way to four and then 20 minutes like yeah. there's you could sleep a little bit less. you could sleep you know five hours at night and then take a 30 minute nap during the day and you it's i think it's similar like i know my mentor who um i think that's what he sleeps for four hours at night and then he, i think he takes a nap in the middle of the day dr uh, eddie's going to talk about sleep okay <laughs> anyway next question here um this comes from Carlos. Is it really useful to learn how to draw at hand instead of drawing digitally? Using Control Z frequently will make me less thoughtful of my drawing somehow. I don't think it's Control Z. I don't think it's Control Z that will make you do that. Um, I think just the the ability to use another tool is just a good thing. Whether you're drawing, even if you're drawing with a pencil, I think learning digitally is beneficial as well to, to drawing with a pencil. I think just being more versatile in the tools you use is good for you. Um, so no, I don't think control Z is that bad. Is, I mean, yeah. Ah, Marshall, what do you think? <laughs> I think this is one of those questions that we need one of those little panels of buttons that you push, that you push this button to give you the answer that we've yeah, answered there's so no many answer. times, which is you just use both and yeah. be aware when you're overdoing one because it's got a bad consequence. Yeah. And don't like, if you notice yourself pressing control Z 15 times between every single stroke, you obviously have a problem. And but you can have it. the same, you get, yeah, but you can have the same problem drawing in pencil where you erase every single line you put down because you're trying to get the right, you know, you, you could have a similar problem. So these kinds of things, they happen at any, within any part of your training or the use of your tools. There's a wrong way to use a tool and there is a right way to, for you. Um, Pressing control Z 15 times could end up being a good thing for you. <laughs> it, it's your style. Um, and so, but you recognize if you think this is a problem, then stop pressing control Z so many times. Take the button off. Press the Z, take the Z button off your keyboard. I've heard people do that uh, until you stop, you know, get that habit out of there. But yeah, I just cross more cross training in general, I think is good. I think so too. Oh, wow. They just pinned a whole bunch of comments. Okay. Um, should, how are we going to do this in the amount of time that we've got? 
we got five let's just do a few more and then okay yeah um sean says what would your ideal entry to this month's proco challenge look like or how would you design your entry um i'm not the judge ah <sighs> I'm not the judge, so I, I'm not Wait, the what, what is this week's Proco challenge? It's this month's Proco this challenge. This month. What is it? Uh, Carlo Ortiz is the judge, and it's uh, my life as a movie poster. So if there was a movie <sighs> being made about your life, you have to now create a movie poster for that movie. Um, and yeah, the, the judging criteria is on the page. Go to um, Proco. Go to proco.com slash party, and then somewhere in there is the, the judge. But anyway, or, or is the link to the, the, the challenge. You could also go to the proco.com, go to lessons, and then you'll find the, the challenge there. Um, oh, proco.com slash challenge is the short code. And Carla has her criteria, but there's 20 different winners. And so there's some of the sponsors are also giving prizes, and they have, they're going to have their own criteria. Also, we give out impromptu prizes, which is just kind of like, uh, this one's really funny, so it deserves a prize. Or this one is obnoxious. <laughs> so here you go, obnoxious entry. Um, it, 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 just surprise us, entertain us, impress us, stand out, be yourself, and be awesome. And there's stand no ideal. I think yeah. it's one of the best Proco challenge. It's one of the best challenges I know, I've I know. ever that was heard. Amazing. When Christian <laughs> Christian messaged me and said, here's what the Proco challenge, I thought, what a great idea. Yeah, it's got it's so many amazing. things going for it. One is that the variety, you can include your family or not include your family. You can yeah. uh, you you can do like when any most movie poster. Some movie posters are named, some movies are named for where they take place. Badlands. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's like, I can just choose my arena where I've lived or the many places I've lived. You can choose the person who's most important to you. You can choose your career. What are you going to put on that movie poster? But the thing that's exciting about it is that this is the perfect balance between what the world is going to be interested in because it's a movie poster that they, a movie they want to see. And then the other thing, which is that it's my life. There yep. is a sense of ownership and on autonomy that I get to make the choice of how I'm going to present my visual autobiography. I loved the idea. Yeah, it's great. I think Carla is the one that came up with it. And we're like, I mean, when I heard it, I was like, that is brilliant. How come nobody's done that before? I, 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 yeah. I think this, this is also my favorite prompt as well. Yeah. And it came at a perfect time because, because we're, we, this is a much longer challenge. I think we gave people six weeks. There's still like three three weeks maybe even yeah three weeks i think left to do it so if you get or two um but there's plenty of time so if you guys want to participate we get we're giving away like thirteen thousand dollars worth of prizes wow um yeah there, there's a lot of prizes so program there's slash a, there, challenge there's another thing i would throw into it and that yeah it, this gives you an opportunity to start looking at the history of movie posters which you will be surprised how in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and into the 50s, movie posters were in in some ways just awful. They were so on the nose. They were so obvious. They had big claims for it. Movie poster design started to evolve in the 70s. True Strews End was a big part of that. And then when the industry almost collapsed around the lack of drawing and inventive talent, as Drew addressed, it started to become photo montages. But just looking at a spectrum of a hundred years of posters, and also go to the go to like Toulouse Lautrec and uh, and theater posters uh, from France and other things, studying posters to see the great range of how people did it can give you inspiration about how you might do a different take on a movie poster than, rather than all the ones that in the last ten years have been so much of a kind. So this got two things going. It's your project, but it also can get you in touch with posters have a, a need to read rapidly rather than like a book illustration. Cool. I think this is a great place to, uh, to conclude it. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much. We're at exactly two hours ish right now. Um, Did we neglect just wanna anything? What's that? Did we neglect did we, anything? Did, yeah. Did we neglect anything? No, this was just the fun thing where we answer people's questions. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, you, you got your workshop. So everybody go. If you want to do a composition workshop, 
starting in two days or three days? It starts on Saturday at the same time that this podcast started. And, and how long does it run for? They're two hours each week. Okay. And it is it is not a webinar where I just teach. It is a boot camp. Hey, right. let me just take one more minute. <laughs> this is okay. something that I'm 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 willing to make this public. I'm mil- willing to make all of these assignments public for free. Uh, you can see this, right? No, not yet. Oh, maybe it'll take. Uh, a minute. I, oh, I have to choose the window. Give me just a moment. Session screen two. Uh, no, not screen window. There we are. Composition workshop. Uh, oh, that's not mine. That's uh, that's my <laughs> my colleagues. My colleagues are doing a, an animation school. Cat animation. Cat dash animation dot com. Who I recommend them to you too. But let me show you what I'm doing starting on Saturday. Here is the twelve week schedule of the well, subjects we take. And each one of these things, the role of composition, choose your art parents dash creatively. I will give a pep talk on choosing your art parents, but it is your job that week to spend maybe two, three, four hours choosing your art parents creatively. And what does that mean? I'll explain the difference between exercises and projects. Uh, We'll talk about composing your time and space by calendars in your studio, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of these. I am going to be 100% present with you as a group. And if you are only paying the, you you can only get into it as an eavesdropper for the cheap price. But if you do anywhere between three and 30 hours of work each week, you choose what you do for the homework. So that's where it takes some creativity on your behalf. And each one of the, each week, I will give you these assignment placards, which I'm going to go through one more. I, each of the following assignment screens will be available and ev- to you and everyone else. My goal is this summer to refine these placards into the most useful composition mastering regimen available until someone ups it. And they are session one project, choose your art parents, elements and principles projects, analysis and instinct projects where you begin the reveries from emotion somewhere in here, deeply into here. When we do image as music, your assignment will be to create reveries based on music, uh, et cetera. So that is back, that's back to my pitch. I guess I'm ending this with the pitch. Uh, but it was in answer to your question. We start on Saturday. These are not to uh, just come in and, and listen to me talk. These are to send you out. Yeah, uh, that's an important part. Of it. This is a boot camp. It's not yeah. a, a lecture thing. Cool. Um, so yeah, go sign up at Marshall's website. And then, so just want to, I guess, end it by telling people this live thing, we're doing this for like several more weeks. This is part of the party where we're celebrating the launch of Proco 2.0. And so if you want to see all the other cool stuff we're doing, go to Proco.com slash party. Uh, week three is now starting and, uh, it's, Today, we also have Steven Zapata's video that came out. Tomorrow, we got David Doodles is releasing a free video. Oh, good. Wednesday, David Luke Coleman? Brown. Yep. Yep. David Great. Coleman. David Doodles. I don't know what Yeah, he's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lane Brown on Wednesday is doing a live stream. He's going to be showing you Procreate and how to draw. He's going to be doing a drawing demo and then answering your questions. Also, Wednesdays, Andrew Keith has a Bridgman quick sculpt demo. Really? So he's gonna be, yeah, it's, it's so it's cool. A Bridgman he, quick yeah, sculpt. Bridgman Quick Sculpt. He he took questions. It's pre-recorded, but he took questions from the community, and he was he's answering them. It's a one-hour demo where he does a one-hour sculpture from a from the Bridgman book. Wow! Um, while answering questions from the community. So if you're a sculptor, don't miss that on Wednesday. Um, Thursday, Slu is doing something special on his channel, and then Friday, Jeremy Cranford is answering questions about work. Uh, you know, por- mostly portfolio reviews for you know, working in video games as an artist. Great. And then and also, I'm also doing a live stream on Friday. Okay. Anyway, lots of stuff. And then we keep doing this for like three more weeks. Thanks, Marshall. Wow. Stan, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. This is it. I, I can't end this. I think John has to do it. So, John, give us 15 more seconds to just be awkward for a little bit. And yeah. I don't know what we're going to do.